All right, thank you. Thank you for the warm welcome, for the warm welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, I've been to the Peniel Church uh, in 2013. Uh, that was when my wife, Anna, was uh, going through cancer treatment. And uh, I still remember the church uh, meeting in a, in a home uh, just outside. There was a, the house was the Pandal. I don't exactly remember whose house it is, uh, but I remember going to the church being uh, visiting your church in 2013. Thank you so much, uh, Majri Aunty, for the uh, for the invitation, and thank you so much. Good, so good to hear uh, Brother Jacob Chako again uh, to see his face and his, uh, uh, hear him after so many years. Praise God! All right, I've been asked to share my testimony and uh, connected with the cost of discipleship for the first session, and uh, let me begin. Uh, in the book of Psalms, in Psalm 40, verses 1 to 3, it says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he turned to me and he heard my cry. He pulled me out of the desolate pit and out of the miry clay. He set my feet upon the rock. He made my steps secure. He put a new song into my heart, a song of praise to our God. And many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. In the year 1963, I was born in an Orthodox Syrian Christian home. And... Uh, Having been born in an Orthodox Syrian Christian home, we were taught to cross ourselves. And um, very faithfully, I would cross myself as a little child. I never knew the meaning of the cross. By the way, um, I did not become a Christian because I was born in a, by virtue of being born in a Christian home. In fact, I was an Orthodox, I was, not, I was an Orthodox Syrian Christian uh, before I became a Christian. Cats and dogs are born in Christian homes. By virtue of being born in a Christian home, no one becomes a Christian. My parents were doctors, as uh, mentioned, highly qualified. My dad was the first open heart surgeon in the state of Kerala. And my mom was a well-known general physician. In the year 1974, my paternal grandfather died. I was very close to my grandfather. And uh, that was my first encounter with death. And I had serious questions. Is this life worth living? Or is death the end? Is there a purpose for my existence? My childish faith had no answers to those questions. In the year 1980, I began to search for God. I had already become a rebel at my home. I had two passions in my life, which I pursued with great diligence. One was a lawn tennis, that was my first love. And the second was music. I could play four instruments at a very young age, the tabla, the drums, uh, the guitar, and the harmonica. And the guitar and the harmonica I could play, play together. And I used to sing in a hotel uh, with one of the top rock bands of the country at that time. The band was called 1380. But my first passion was tennis. I literally worshiped the game. And soon I was ranked uh, the sub-junior state, uh, sub-junior district champion, then the junior district uh, number one. And then I was ranked Kerala state uh, junior number two in 1980. And my goal in life was to become like Beyond Bob. He was my hero. He had won the Wimbledon and the Grand Slam uh, five times, uh, consequently. And I decided to become a professional tennis player. And uh, to me, Beyond Bob was uh, my hero in life. And the moment I mentioned uh, professional tennis at home, a war broke out at home. My father said, absolutely no. And uh, so we had argument after argument, uh, night after night. He would say no, and I would say yes. And uh, he would again say no, and I would say yes. And we just went on and on, endless arguments. And um, it, the, some of those arguments even turned uh, quite violent. Uh, finally, I had to go for the coaching camp, the tennis coaching camp, the state level uh, tennis coaching camp. And tennis, of course, is a very expensive game. And I didn't have money to go in for the camp. So I decided uh, to do something which was, <laughs> uh, which I laugh at now, but in those days I, would, I took it very seriously. I sold uh, uh, my father's medical journals and uh, the newspaper at home. And with that money, I, I registered in for the camp. And uh, that was the end of my tennis career. My dad came to the camp, took me home, beat me up, confiscated my tennis gear. Uh, my racket and my tennis gear was gone and 
I spoke to the coach. Uh, I mean, he, he spoke to the coach and uh, he put a full stop uh, to my game. And my dream in life was shattered. In fact, the coach came home. He brought the coach home trying to convince me that uh, I shouldn't think of uh, professional tennis. But nothing worked. Uh, uh, my dream was just shattered. So I began, I, I was a rebel at home. There was no peace in my family. Constant arguments going on and uh, fights at home. And uh, uh, you know, my dad and I wouldn't see eye to eye. And, the mid and in the middle of all this, in the midst of my rebellion, I began to search for God. I began to read books on religion and philosophy. Anything that I could pick my hands on with regard to religion and philosophy, I would read. I went to my Brahmin friend's uh, father and I asked him for books on Hinduism. And he challenged me to read the Bible. Now, as a kid, my grandfather had, uh, had made me learn quite a few Psalms by heart. Uh, but I could never understand them because uh, the only Bible in that day that we had was the King James Version. And it was Queen's English and the, my English was uh, very poor. And uh, so I read, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And I understood it as the Lord is my shepherd whom I don't want. I could never figure out, I could never figure out what the Bible meant. Now little did I know that the Bible said, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness unto him. Neither does he know them because they are spiritually discerned. You see, the Bible, Bible can never be understood without the Holy Spirit, the author of the Bible, but I never knew any of that. I wish there was someone at that point of time who could have explained things to me, but there was not anybody. So I used the Bible as a magic book. At night, I wanted to go to sleep because uh, you know I had all this uh, rebellion. I was uh, so rebellious and we had all these fights at home and uh, sleepless nights, so I wanted to go to sleep, so I would read the Bible, and uh, when I read the Bible, I would go to sleep, and so I would put it under my pillow and go to sleep. And in my search for God, I would read anything regarding to religion and philosophy, as I told you. Uh, I even went into reading Tibetan monk philosophy, uh, books like uh, written by Lop Sang Rampa. I never knew I was tampering with the occult in doing that. But because I love my grandfather, I also began reading some of his collections. Uh, one of his books was on a fat book uh, called The Story of Christ, uh, written by Giovanni Papini, uh, translated from Latin to English. And uh, for the first time in my life, I understood something about the cross. Something about the cross. I realized that it was not just physical pain that Jesus went through on the cross. It was the mental agony of bearing the sin of the whole world upon his sinless, perfect body and crying out, my Lord, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, the next book that I read was uh, Peace with God by Billy Graham. Billy Graham spoke of sin. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. He went on to say that there is a great gulf between God and man, and that gulf is the gulf of sin. Now, I knew I was a sinner not only because I had this deep bitterness and hatred to my father who crushed my dream, but I also recognized that I was a sinner because I was born with the nature of sin. Then Billy, Billy Graham uh, spoke of the cross. He quoted the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 53. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was laid on him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. Every one of us, we have turned to our own ways. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. God is a just God, and he must punish sin. But God is a God of love, and he desires to forgive the sinner. He is a God of love and mercy, and he wants to forgive the sinner. Now, how can God be a just God and a God of love and mercy at the same time? The words that followed went something like this, and those words still ring in my ears. Man's only salvation from sin lies on a lonely, rugged, skull-shaped hill, and the name of that hill is Golgotha. A thief hangs on a cross on one side, and a murderer hangs on the other, and in between them hangs a man with a crown of thorns, a crown of thorns banged into his head. Blood drips from his hands, blood drips from his feet. Blood gushes from his side, blood drips over his body. 
and those who are standing in front of him mock him and say, if you're the son of God, come down from the cross. And the words from the cross that Jesus spoke were, my father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. What greater love can there be than the love of Calvary? Who is this, who is this uh, tortured figure? Who is this who hangs between heaven and earth on a wooden cross? He is the Prince of Peace, the Son of God, heaven's own messenger to the sin ridden earth. The justice and love of God meet at the cross on Calvary in the person of Jesus Christ. Then I read the words of Jesus Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. I will sup with him. I will sup with him and he with me. I knelt down beside my bed, tears rolling down my face, and I gave my heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. And immediately I experienced God's uh, love being poured out into my heart. And that's true because that's what Romans chapter 5 verse 5 says. Uh, Romans chapter 5 verse 5 says, God has poured out his love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And I got up from my knees, a new man, with a great passion of wanting everyone I met to know about Jesus. And I opened the door and the first person I saw was my father. The hatred and the bitterness in my heart toward my father had disappeared. And I told him, didn't Jesus come to die on the cross to forgive us? And he was bewildered. He was wondering what had happened to his son. The next thing that happened was uh, the Lord Jesus planted my feet in Bihar. I came to know the Lord just before I joined engineering college. So the Lord took me uh, to Bihar in Jamshedpur, where I got admission into RIT Jamshedpur, a regional engineering college, what you would call today an NIT. And that was God's seminary for me. But I had no clue about the fact that Bihar was the graveyard of missions. Those days, uh, Jamshedpur was in Bihar. Today, it's in Jharkhand. I didn't know that Bihar was called the graveyard of missions. I never knew of any militant anti-Christian organization till I came face to face with the reality of that in Bihar. And persecution began on day one in my hostel room. It came in the pretext of ragging. Members of this militant group senior students came into my room and they noticed my Bible on my study table and they took it and threw it to the floor and I went after it and that was the beginning. They identified me as a Christian, a witnessing Christian and they would barge into my room at night, uh, take me to the terrace and just punch me with their fists as though I was a punching bag. And this would happen night after night. Now I know why I went through all that uh, tennis exercise regime because God was actually preparing me physically for all this physical torture. I was very strong physically because I used to run 10 kilometers in the morning, roll the tennis court. My admission into pre-university was because of tennis. So I, I had no problem for attendance. Uh, I didn't have to attend class. Uh, I would play tennis the whole day practically. Run early in the morning do all the exercises, uh, roll the tennis court, and play against the wall. And in the evening when others would come to play, I would play with them. But now I know why all that took place, because God was physically preparing me for all this uh, torture. Now, during the ragging period, we had a uniform, black trousers and white shirt, full sleeves and black shoes. We had to be dressed in these clothes, whether it was day or night. And when the seniors barged into our rooms, whatever be the time, we had to have these clothes on and even our shoes on. And one night I decided to have a bath late into the night because we hardly had time to have a bath because of all, all that was happening, all this confusion. And uh, this militant group just broke into the bathroom that night, late night, dragged me out naked, made me crawl on the floor and began to just beat me up with the leg of a broken chair. And I was crying out on the floor, soap all over my body, and I was in pain, and I was crying out, Jesus, Jesus. And a few minutes later, a tall, dark man appeared at the end of the corridor, 
and he shouted with a loud voice with a great with great authority in hindi ruko he said and these persecutors just stopped all of a sudden and left and the tall dark man left too and i still don't know who he is i believe was he was an angel angel sent from god one day my roommate francis and i were made to jump off the pavement from the first floor and now i knew how to jump and i landed uh, i landed on my feet without any damages but my dear friend francis he jumped and he broke his leg and his leg had to be plastered but this led to my leaving college for a break to take francis home now persecution continued after i returned even through the even though the ragging period was over and i would ask god to give me opportunity to share the gospel with someone every day in the evening after class and in the second year of engineering a classmate of mine from manipur he came to me asking about my faith in christ and his name was rishikesh and he hailed from the royal family of the of the maithes in manipur and i had the privilege of leading rishikesh to christ and rishi got baptized in a baptist church in town and from then on persecution just escalated on the campus and our lives were in great danger by now there were three of us in the campus who were witnessing christians rishi and i and a classmate named premanandam from andhra pradesh but we were threatened to be killed many times i was taken to a room once by my own uh, classmates my bihari classmates they and they threatened uh, threatened me with guns guns pointed at me from all sides and uh, this was actually after i shared the gospel with a classmate named ajay singh who was a rajput and when they knew i was not afraid to die ajay singh ajay singh just told me to get out of the room our lives were in danger but it was a time it was during this time that we got very close to the heart of god we used to go up uh, to the water tank uh, which uh, was a uh, just outside the college campus and we used to climb up right on to right up on the water tank and the three of us would sit there and just weep and pray for the college hoping and praying that uh, you know god's word would just get across to everyone in the campus today thanks be to god there is a a church right next to the right next to the campus and i know of uh, people who have gone through rit jamshedpur now as very committed christians so we were threatened to be killed many times but god kept us he preserved us and uh, i am alive today because of god's mercy and goodness and uh, kindness and i still have a heart for bihar and i still uh, am concerned about what happens in bihar what is happening by the way there's so much of persecution right now in bihar and in jharkhand when i had this call uh, for ministry while i was a student while i was going through all this uh, i had a very specific call for ministry and i wanted to quit engineering du- during my second year in college but god sent a prophet to jamshedpur his name was dr nakliyan and some of you would know him because he studied in cmc i never knew that uh, he was uh, very close to my father and either did uh, i know that uh, but nakliyan came on that day the day i would i had planned to leave and he told me not to leave college he said the lord who has called you will call you again and this is your training ground now i obeyed what he said after a long argument late into the night he finally said listen to me i am an old man i have gray hair and i've been in this business for many years and i said uh, all right uncle i'll listen to you but i want god to speak to me and tell me that he wants me to stay on here because i thought my time was up in the campus because all that was happening was just persecution and uh, i thought it was all over it's time now to leave but the lord confirmed to me what uh, the prophet said the next day morning in my morning quiet time the lord spoke to me from his word and he said brethren let every man wherein he is called therein abide with god so i stayed on in the campus completed my engineering with a first class and uh, the lord gave me the gift of composing music and songwriting he put a new song into my heart the psalmist says in psalm 40 he put a new song into my heart a song of praise to our god and many will see and fear and put their trust in the lord so the lord would turn all my troubles into songs 
and that was a real blessing. I was involved in the EU ministry and the student ministry in Jamshedpur. We had to get to, to get to the town, to get to a fellowship, we had to travel 13 kilometers by bus. But we loved to go because uh, that was the only place we had fellowship with uh, fellow believers. So I was involved with, uh, with the student ministry and also with, the, with OM, Operation Mobilization. And I met Brother P.C. Vergis and Jonathan Mar Maharaj during my student days in Bihar. And Brother P.C. was my mentor for many years. And it was in the early 80s that I met Usha Uthip in Calcutta. You would have seen her on the, on the video introducing me. I met her at a home in Park Street and she asked me to sing and I sang my songs. The songs that I'd written in the, I was 19 years of age at that time and she gave me her studio free of cost to do my songs, to record my songs. And she put me up on radio programs during Christmas time and took me to concerts to sing. And because of all this, I shot to fame in college and the principal in college invited me home to hear what I had to say. And he knew that I was also persecuted and uh, he asked me to name the names of the boys who persecuted me. And I said, sir, I can't do that. I forgive them because they do not know what they're doing. And he was deeply touched by that. And he asked me how he could help me. I said, I, I asked him if he could authorize the, the audiovisual department to show the movie King of Kings. King of Kings was uh, uh, based on the Gospel of John. And uh, we had it in Hindi. And uh, so I asked him, can you authorize the, the audiovisual department to show this movie in the college auditorium? And he agreed. And we had the whole college. He, he in fact, uh, wrote the letter, put it up onto the hostel notice boards, and we had the whole college watch the movie based on the Gospel of John. And I can say today that there was not a single person in that campus who left college at that time without hearing the Gospel. I did my first album called Lead Me On in the year 1986, backed by 1380. And I did my second album, Elohim, again backed by 1380 in the year 1980. The band 1380 was very supportive, although they knew that I was committed only to doing gospel music from the time I gave my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. I've done a total of five albums, around 50 gospel songs, the words and music given to me by the Lord Jesus. And there's a YouTube channel, and uh, I've uh, actually given the link over to Benji and to also Sister Madrin. And so you could get it, get it, and uh, it, it is that, that channel was started just recently to put my old songs into, into uh, uh, a video format with the lyrics. And so you can go ahead and uh, connect to that channel whenever you want. I got married to my childhood sweetheart, Anna, who's also called Tessa. We got married in 1987. Anna is a doctor. By the way, she studied in CMC Velo. Uh, she's an ophthalmologist. Uh, she did a basic training MBBS in uh, Velo, and she had come to Christ while studying in Bain School in Madras. Around the same time, I gave my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Our daughter Esther was born to us in 1980, 1990 in, in CMC, uh, and Esther is now married to Sam Koshi, and they are both working in a Christian NGO in Mumbai with slum kids, and we are now grandparents. And our granddaughter Tabitha is two years plus now. I worked on the mission ship MV Dulos in, in the year 1987, and then joined CMC Velo in the engineering department. And I used to look after the boilers and the pumps and the generators and the medical gas equipment in CMC. And we came back uh, to Kerala in 1990 after Esther was born. I left my last job with OEN Connectors in 1995, and I traveled with Brother PC Vagis. Uh, doing itinerant uh, ministry, fulfilling the call of God. And we started the church, the Shama Tabernacle, in our home in 1996. I've been pastoring the church since then, and it has been a real blessed journey. Now, in the context of our retreat today with the theme on discipleship, let me say this. Our salvation costs us nothing, but it costs Jesus his very life. Our salvation costs us nothing. Salvation is a gift of God. We receive that gift when we trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord. But to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, that is costly. It may even cost you your life. 
And Jesus spoke these words in Mark chapter 8, verses 34 to 36. And calling the crowd to him with his, with his disciples, he said, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? I like what Jacob said in the beginning. They begin to value that which is most important. In John 12, verses 24 to 26, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, my father will honor him. By the way, both my parents came to Christ after my experience of salvation. My younger, yeah, my younger brother, seeing uh, the change that took place in my life, he gave his heart to the Lord Jesus. And then my parents, after which my parents came to Christ, and I have had the privilege of baptizing both my parents and my wife's parents. We are now living in very perilous times. The church in India is going through persecution like never before. Three Christians, uh, three Christian workers were killed in just a single month, uh, the month of July this year. And since the lockdown, there has been a 41% increase of persecution in India. By the way, your state of Tamil Nadu is uh, ranked next to UP with regard to uh, persecution, next to UP. UP is the top on the list. So being a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ is costly. Yes, it is. But it is costlier not to be a disciple of Christ. And the scripture encourages us uh, in these times, especially Revelation chapter 12, verse 11 says, And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they loved not their lives even unto death. The hymn, in, uh, the hymn in that verse, uh, they have conquered him. The hymn is the accuser, the devil. And our battle is not against flesh and blood. Ephesians 6 verse 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against uh, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So these are the forces of darkness that are actually binding these uh, persecutors of God's church. And so we bind the strong man in the name of Jesus and we plead the blood of Jesus Christ over their lives. And this is warfare. This is spiritual warfare. We are saved and we are being sanctified and we live a consecrated, a consecrated life to fight these spiritual forces of darkness. And we stand on victory ground today because in Christ, we are overcomers. We overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. By the word of our testimony. And we do not love our lives our lives even unto death. Revelation 12 verse 11. The word lives there in Revelation chapter 12 verse 11 is uh, in the original Greek it is suke, meaning our flesh lives. As believers we live in the spirit. We don't yield to the works of the flesh. We yield to the, uh, to the, the, to the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And more of this tomorrow when we continue with the subject of sanctification and consecration. Let me close now saying the journey with Jesus Christ in my life, my family, and God's church has been such a blessed journey. And I request you all to keep us as a family and as a church in prayer. Thank you so much for inviting me for your retreat. And uh, I continue to look forward to uh, tomorrow and the time that we have together. God bless. Over to you. Pastor. Um... Pastor, thank you so much for challenging us with your testimony. Um, we're really amazed the way God has wonderfully worked in your life. Um, and uh, we will now be actually moving into a time as church members, we will have a time of fellowship. Uh, it's been a long time since we met each other, but even before this um, uh, retreat was beginning, it was uh, really nice to see uh, many of us who had put our videos on, we could see the background of our homes, Pushpa Ipan, Christina Ipan.